Let me just give you a little introduction about what we're going to do. Uh, on my far right is Stuart Eisenstadt. Um, Stuart, uh, about 40 years ago, interviewed me for a job in the Carter campaign. Uh, I got the job, and uh, I went to work for Stuart in the Carter campaign in 1976. And at the time that I was hired, Carter was 34 points ahead of Gerald Ford. After my work, Carter won by one point. <laughs> so, but despite that, uh, Stuart hid me from Carter, and I still got a job in the White House. I worked for Stuart for four years in the White House. Stuart was the um, d domestic policy advisor to President Carter, and he served in many other Democratic administrations. And I um, asked him if he would come tonight to talk about one particular thing. It was his memo to President Carter which uh, created the Holocaust Memorial in Washington, D.C. Stewart is now the chairman of that board for the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Many of you have probably been there. And as a sideline, he has, on a pro bono basis, been trying to recover assets that were stolen from uh, Holocaust victims and their families and has so far recovered roughly $17 billion in assets for those victims. So, thank you. Ferris um, is the person who wrote this book, which I highly recommend. Very readable, very interesting. I won't say enjoyable, because you can't say it's an enjoyable book, but it's very interesting, and it's obviously sad in many ways. Ferris spent about three years on the book, right? So I'm going to talk, I'm going to ask Stuart some questions first about the Holocaust, Ferris about the book, and then uh, Stephen and Marion. And I should disclose my own relationship with uh, Marion. A number of years ago, I hired a young man to come to work for me at Carlisle. That young man was the person who just brought Marion out. That's her son, Mark Ein. Mark Ein is now one of the owners of the Commanders, uh, among other things. And, uh, so, and Marion and Stuart have a relationship as well, so it's very close. Everybody here likes everybody else. Okay. <laughs> and Stephen um, is the, obviously the twin brother. Okay, so let's start. <laughs> All right, so Stuart, um, you sent a memo to President Carter uh, recommending a memorial to the Holocaust. Why was there no memorial? This was 1978 or so. How come there, the country had never had a memorial to the Holocaust? So let's start at the beginning. My epiphany occurred in 1968 when I was working uh, on the Hubert Humphrey presidential campaign against Nixon and I met Arthur Morse, who was a fellow worker and had just published a book called While Six Million Died, which chronicled what FDR and his administration knew about the genocide of the Jews and failed to act on it. It was a shock because FDR was an icon in our house and I pledged to myself at that time when I was 25 years old that I was gonna do anything I could if I had a senior position in administration to remove this cloud from the otherwise glorious history of the United States in World War II. And that time came in 1978 when there was Shades of Charlottesville, uh, a neo-Nazi uh, effort to march through Skokie, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Half the population was Jewish, 10%, 7,000 were survivors, and this caused a huge uproar and great pain for the survivors. William Sapphire, a columnist for the New York Times, wrote an op-ed article about this, and he said that when President Anwar Sadat of Egypt made his first visit to Israel, Menachem Begin, the prime minister, took him to Yad Vashem. And said Sapphire, the United States has no such memorial. And when my staff saw that, they said, you know, you should do something about it. I wrote this memo to Carter, suggested we create a presidential commission headed by Elie Wiesel. They in turn recommended what's now the museum. And 50 million visitors later, uh, we now have the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. So um, sometimes uh, people who are Jewish dispute things from time to time, and they, you know, have some arguments. So uh, this memo to Carter was, what, year 1978? It was in 1978, and it was announced, okay. David, just at the time when, Pres when Prime Minister Begin was in Washington, both for the anniversary of Israel's formation, but also for Middle East peace talks. He himself had a Holocaust family background, and it was very meaningful to him. We had 1,200 people, rabbis and other Jewish leaders there, and that's where it got its start. The Presidential Commission made a recommendation, uh, which was we accepted in 1979. The museum 
was opened in a unique way, David. It's a public-private partnership, congressionally chartered, the only museum that has a public-private charter. We get about 40% of our budget from Congress and we raise the rest. Uh, the building itself cost about $200 million to build, and we're now revitalizing the entire permanent exhibit. Why? Because we now realize the, the Economist had a survey this week, this week, in which 20% of Americans between 18 and 39 thought the Holocaust was a myth, and the claims conference for whom I've negotiated about $9 billion in recoveries did a survey very recently that showed that almost 60% of that age cohort couldn't identify Auschwitz. So what we're trying to do at the museum is not only look back at what happened, but ask why did it happen? Why did a cultured, educated country abandon democracy, the rule of law? Why did doctors, lawyers, judges, academics violate their own professional oaths to take this racist ideology? And that's gonna be the focus of the revitalized museum. And may I just say, in your honor, that all the educational work we do, including now in 100 libraries with pop-up exhibits, with the American Library Association, everything we do educationally, we get the artifacts from the David Rubenstein National Center for Holocaust Documentation, which David endowed. And David, that is the fundamental basis upon which we teach the Holocaust. So thank you for your thank contribution. Thank you, Stuart. So, um, <laughs> Stuart, um, the memo went to President Carter in 78, 79 or so. The, the, the study came out saying we should have a, a museum. Why did it take it until 1993 to get it open? Well, first of all, why was it only 1978? I'm mean, after all, this was 30 years after the war. And the fact is, there were no courses on the Holocaust, even at Yeshiva University. It was not considered a proper thing to study. It was the mini-series of NBC that first elevated it. Uh, and so the Holocaust had been, because of the Cold War, elevated to the sidelines. And it's only when archives started to be opened that this okay. became. So it took us 15 years to raise the money, to get the site, to have okay. the architect develop the site. Uh, it was opened by Bill Clinton in September of 1993, 14 years after President Carter's executive order. One of the issues I recall was, what, who is a Holocaust victim? Do you have to be Jewish or not Jewish? This was a very contentious issue. Uh, Elie Wiesel, who was the chairman of Blessed Memory, uh, said that this had to be exclusively for Jews. They were the victims of the Holocaust. Six million, one and a half million kids. And because we were a public museum, we were congressionally chartered, we had a very significant internal battle over how to define it. And in the end, his own commission, and he had great difficulty with this, defined the Holocaust as the systematic murder by the Nazi regime and their collaborators of six million Jews and millions of others. All right. How, what percentage of people go there now are Jewish? So this is really interesting. We just did a survey. I mentioned uh, at the peak, pre-COVID, we had 1.4 million people a day, uh, a year, excuse me, a year. And it's now 1.1 million, but coming back. And 93% of those who come are non-Jewish. 25% are young school children. 22% are people of color. So we're reaching a much broader audience. And for people of color, this is really important at a time now when there are tensions between our communities. We are trying to demonstrate, and we will do more in the a new permanent exhibit, the Nazi ideology was not just religious, it was racial. We were defined as an inferior race. If you were 1 16th Jewish, you were in a racial category that meant you could be persecuted and killed. So we're trying to demonstrate that this was not just a Jewish, right. but a racial so ideology. So if you were a German Jew and you didn't go to synagogue and you said, well, I'm really not that religious and you didn't get bar mitzvah or anything, would Hitler go after you still? Well, well, this is a great segue into this story because they were largely secular Jews. Uh, Mengele did not, when he made a selection, make 
a choice between whether you were secular or orthodox. Anybody who was Jewish by their definition, right. which again was racial, was subject to, to murder. There weren't six, you know, six million orthodox Jews. It's also important, please understand this. When we talk about six million, in 1939, before the war started, there were 17 million Jews in a world of one billion. Today, 2023, there are less than 15 million Jews in a world of 8 billion. We've never regained our numbers. Right. But not only that, we lost the flower of European religion, culture, art, scholarship, right. and the death of two-thirds of European Jewry. So let me talk about the recovery of assets. So how did you get involved with saying you're going to recover assets, and how hard has it been, and, and uh, do you get a percentage of the assets you recover? Well, if I did, I would be in your category. <laughs> okay. All right, 20% carried interest, right. But you, you've been doing this so long, right? So look, this is important. The Holocaust was not just the genocide of the Jews. It was the robbery of the Jews. The Nazis systematically, as systematically as they did the actual killing, robbed the Jews of their culture, of their art, of their possessions, of their businesses, of their homes, of their personal possessions, of their, uh, of their musical instruments, to wipe out root and branch the whole Jewish religion, its culture, its history. And so what we tried to do starting on President Clinton in 1993 when he asked me as I was ambassador to the European Union at the time to take a dual assignment and to start this restitution process. Nobody was doing it before. The Nazis stole 600,000 paintings. And thanks to the US government and uh, those art curators, we got 100,000 of those back. But there's still tens of thousands. And we're working on it this very day. We have a, a, a meeting by Zoom tomorrow at 9 o'clock with 14 countries to accelerate the Washington principles on Nazi looted art, which I negotiated with 44 countries. Christie's and right. Sotheby's now have full-time staffs. Uh, we have five countries that have claims commissions. So this is just one example, but we have only recovered a f tiny fraction, maybe five, 10 percent of what was stolen okay. from the Jews. Stuart, how many Holocaust And they're a good example. I mean, their own family. How many Holocaust survivors are there living today? There are 240,000 Holocaust survivors. It's a larger number than most people think. And with all the funds we've created, 90% of those in the former Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe are at or below the poverty level. 35% of the survivors, about 120,000, 140,000 in Israel, are at or below the poverty level. 30% of the survivors in the United States. And in this very city, your federation did a study showing that 40% of the 40,000 Holocaust survivors in the New York area, New York City area, are at or below the federal poverty level. That's unacceptable. These are people who lived in such indignity as Stephen and, and Marion and her parents did as young kids, and now in their declining years to have to do it is totally unacceptable. Stuart, I want to thank you for what you've done for uh, people who were Holocaust victims and for what you're doing now as the chairman of the Holocaust Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, Ferris Cassell, um, there's an old saying you may have seen, remember an advertisement, said you don't have to be Jewish to like Levy's uh, rye bread, if I recall. But well, you don't have to be Jewish to write a book about the Holocaust, right? So you're not Jewish, right? I'm not Jewish. Okay. And in fact, when I first, the first book I wrote about the Holocaust came about because of a letter uh, that was a desperate letter by Viennese Jews um, begging for help to come to right. America. It, uh, through my husband's patient, he was a physician, came to me, and I had no idea what to do with it. I did not know anything really about the Holocaust. I took it to um, Michael Berenbaum, 
right. one of the founders of the Holocaust Museum, and said, I know that he was a friend of a friend, and he agreed to see me, and, and he, I said, I, I don't know what to do with this. I'm not Jewish, I know it's important, um, and uh, maybe I could give it to you, and you could do something with it. And he said, no. He said, you are exactly the person to do it. Okay. You are the person who will bring people who are not Jewish into an understanding of what the Holocaust was all about. So um, have you ever thought of converting? No. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So you live in Eugene, Oregon, where there probably is not a large Jewish population, my guess is. I don't know. But um, how long did it take? How did you hear about this particular story? Um, I was just finishing up the, with... Um, the, the promotion of my first book. And just as I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of glad to be out of my mind um, all the time in the Holocaust in those dark times, my publisher came across a letter written by Marion, um, an op-ed written by Marion um, for the Los Angeles Times in which she, she um, expressed her gratitude for the COVID workers who were risking their lives in those pre-vaccine times uh, to help others, okay. which reminded her of the Jews in Bergen-Belsen who um, risked their lives to help each other um, to survive. Okay, so um, how long did it take you to write this and research this book? Um, you could say it took three years or you could say it took 20. Okay. Um, because that's when I started learning about the Holocaust. It's about 20 years ago. What was the biggest surprise to you in doing the research and writing the book? Um, it's hard. It, that's really difficult to answer because um, I was surprised all along, step by step, many times. I was surprised by the courage, by the love, by the incredible resilience and um, genius of this okay. family in surviving the Holocaust. All right, so we're going to talk to Stephen and Mary in a minute, but for just to summarize a minute, what is the essence of the story? What, were, what happened to them? And if you just take us through in a paragraph or two the essence of the story. Uh, the story is about a family, two, um, two German Jews, the twins' parents, Carl and Ilse Hess, who had been in Germany for generations from time immemorial. And um, when Hitler came to power, um, this young, happily married and successful uh, couple realized that the writing was on the wall and they had to flee. Um, Carl was a manager in United Silk Company, a textile international textile company based in Germany. Um, and he was able to transfer his position to Amsterdam. And so he brought the family over um, to, uh, to live in Amsterdam, hopefully safe and away from the Nazis. Um, I'd like to read you just a minute okay. um, what, how that, um, how it happened that he was able to, to the, move the family. So Carl moved first, and because he was moving with a German company, he was able to go across the border in 1936 um, with no problem whatsoever. Ilsa, his wife, the twins' mother, um, came later, and it was her, and she had much more difficulty because she was um, needed to take all the family's uh, possessions, including jewelry. At the time, it was Hitler's mantra, the Jews must go, their wealth stays. So okay. here's how Ilsa figured okay. out how to do that, how to bring, okay. bring the family some of the standing that they had. Um, Marion told me, um, my mother was called on to grow up all at once. She had left her jewelry for safekeeping with a friend in Switzerland who brought it to her just before my mother planned to leave. My mother never wore makeup and always dressed fashionably but respectably. She told me that to cross the border and leave Germany, she dressed in a tacky outfit that included a red jacket with black velvet lapels. 
She put on mesh stockings, lots of makeup, and simply pinned the family's quite valuable jewelry onto her lapels. Her mother laughed telling this story. In her exact words, in, as Marion says, how could you make this up? She said, I looked like a 10 mark hooker. Obviously, obviously everybody thought the jewelry was fake. So, okay, so they go to, so basically the story is they go, they finally are able to get to Amsterdam. We'll talk about that in a moment uh, with Marion and Stephen, but then eventually um, their luck does not hold out and they get sent to Bergen-Belsen and then ultimately some other things we'll talk about. Is that the essence of it? That is the essence of it. Okay. All right, um, so let's... There is one more addendum okay. to that. They were put on a train out of Bergen-Belsen at the time when there were mountains of dead bodies all over Bergen-Belsen. They were put on a train to go to Theresienstadt, um, and that train became the lost train on which hundreds more people died. It left a trail of dead bodies. Okay, what, what we're referring to is that towards the end of the war, uh, for reasons not really clear, the Nazis put people in Bergen-Belsen on trains in, in animal-like settings, and they didn't know where they were going. Nobody was told. They thought maybe they were going to Auschwitz. Those in Bergen-Belsen had largely avoided Auschwitz, but then eventually they were off, off, many people were sent to Auschwitz. And then this train went on for a while, and then the war ended, more or less, and then they were kind of lost as to where to do, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So let's talk to the to the two survivors. So. Um, I can't remember anything past uh, maybe five years old or six years old. Do you remember anything that, about being in Germany when you were in German, Germany? Well, first of all, we were born in Holland. You were born, born in Holland? Yes. Okay, so oh, your parents escaped my... before you were... Right. Okay. Right. All right, so... They right. came to Amsterdam. Well, my father came in 1936, and we were born in 1938. Okay, so... You remember, how much do you remember of Amsterdam before you went to Bergen-Belsen? Well, you know, there's certain memories that I remember very clearly, and there's also a lot that I have no memory of. Um, I remember very, very clearly the night we were picked up. Um, and I also remember very clearly that, you know, life changed. We weren't allowed to go out or play in the sandbox. I mean, you had a sense that there was a lot of fear and uncertainty, um, and all of a sudden, you know, it was very gloomy. I certainly remember that so the, environment. And, put it in context, when um, Amsterdam had been a neutral country, and it was thought that Hitler would not invade a neutral country, and so uh, your parents escaped to Amsterdam. It wasn't easy to escape, but they did. And they basically got a reasonable job. Your father had a reasonable job, kind of working for the Dutch subsidiary, the company he'd worked in, in in Germany. And then for a while, things were okay. And then eventually, the Nazis came into Amsterdam, and they didn't yet send people to concentration camps. But when they first came in, they had constraints on you, as they had constraints on Jews in Germany. Do you remember the constraints? Either of you remember that you had to live your life differently once the Nazis came in? Um, Stephen, why don't you take... Well, frankly, uh, we were, but by that time, we were, uh, the Nazis invaded in 1940, so we're two years old. Okay. So zero on that. But, but I do remember that we were basically in our apartment uh, because our parents could not take us out. Up. Our parents had to wear a Judenstern, a Jewish store uh, with a curfew and all. Our nanny took us out uh, occasionally. Uh, so from the, er from the er early years, I would say not, however, my wife being a psychiatrist, I asked her, and she said that young children really only remember breakfast and dinner, uh, but you can have mental pictures, right. uh, which are reinforced later by facts. All right, so initially the Nazis went into, into Amsterdam, they kind of put constraints on, as you talked about, where a Jewish star, you can't have the kind of jobs you had before, but at some point they begin to send people to concentration camps, and uh, your father was able, because he was, uh, reasonably well connected in the Dutch Jewish community to avoid being sent for a while. Was that a couple years before he was actually sent and you were sent with him? Right. Um, first of all, uh, just a minor, minor modification that the fact was that when my father 
came and he thought that he would have that job. It wasn't really available. Someone else had taken it. So he was, you know, like everyone else, basically unemployed. Um, and of course, those Jews, the German Jews, many of them were very intelligent, had had good careers. And in the beginning, you know, there was this feeling that somehow you could do something that would prevent you from having to go um, and be taken away. The other issue, which is very important, you know, nobody had any idea where they were being taken to, that it was um, to death. They thought that they were going to like a kibbutz type farm community right. in the East to help out with agriculture. And that's why our parents bought us very sturdy shoes because they thought that maybe that was what being people were being taken. So people didn't really have but any idea. For a while, your father and mother were able to avoid being sent to any place, and however they did it, they managed to keep being sent. Eventually, um, they're given orders to go to um, a place where they're going to be sent to a camp. Did you, you have any memory of when you were actually going on the train to Bergen-Belsen or the other camp you went to? Well, you know, I'll share this answer with my brother, but I do very vividly remember the night we were picked up um, because it was in the middle of the night, and we had a sense somehow that uh, this may happen. I mean, everybody at that point lived in fear. Um, and, you know, people knew that every night there would be these raids and people would be taken away. Did I know the details of it? No, but I did know that, you know, my parents packed a little suitcase because they knew it was inevitable that they would be picked up. Um, and I remember very vividly that in the middle of the night, we were woken up and um, I was kind of stunned by the sounds of boots. You know, they probably had nails, I mean, big boots. And all of a sudden, you know, these kind of heavy steps in our lovely apartment and that we had to get dressed quickly, everything was rush, rush, rush. Um, and before we were taken away, my parents had this, habit, tradition of each of us had a Dutch shoe. Klumpen. A klumpen next to our bed. And every night my parents would fill it with a treat, a candy, a cookies. And as we're being taken away, I remember looking at my klumpen, my Dutch shoe, and it was again filled. And as we rushed out, I asked my mother, can we take that? And she kind of, okay. you know, Made it happen. So, right. so that, do you, either of you have any memory of actually going on the train to Bergen-Belsen? Well, the, uh, we you, were first. You went somewhere else first, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Can you describe the first place you went to? The, uh, the, well, the fir first place was we were lying in a field on a blanket with two suitcases because it was windy, and my mother was trying to shel shelter us from the wind. And then, uh, and then we were taken to uh, by train to Westerborg, which was a Dutch refugee camp that the Dutch government built, the Jews paid for it, uh, to house the refugees from Germany. They didn't want to abandon the refugees. They didn't, they didn't want them in Amsterdam either. So they built a camp. When the Nazis invaded in 1940, they saw Westerbork right on the Dutch-German okay. border and converted it. So how long it. were you there? You were there for how long? About eight months. Eight months. So yeah. after eight months of being there, you're, going, you're sent to Bergen-Belsen, yes. is that right? And did you have any memory of the transition from that camp to Bergen-Belsen? Oh, yes. Uh, we, the, the main desire of everybody in Westerbork was to stay there. It was not a concentration camp. They were not killing people. Uh, but every Tuesday, a train left uh, for, an, for an unknown destination. Uh, my father somehow managed the, the destinations was Auschwitz, which would have meant we would have been murdered upon arrival, uh, and Sobibor, also murdered upon arrival, uh, Theresienstadt, which was uh, a feeding ground for Auschwitz, and Bergen-Belsen, 
which was in Germany. But, but did people know, your father knew that Auschwitz was a murder? No, not in the point, beginning. Nobody knew. But by nobody 1943, 44, okay. the right. knowledge had spread. So are you, how, how old are you when you get to Bergen-Belsen? Five? Uh, it was uh, uh, February 44, so we were six years old. Six years old. And are, when you get to Bergen-Belsen, uh, what is it like? Did people say, we're glad you're here, it's a friendly camp, it's just going to be a workplace? What, what was it like? Well, well, um, I mean, first of all, you know, we knew that that was much worse than Vestibor because um, it was a slave labor camp. I didn't know that, of, that of course. But I mean, first of all, we were put in a cattle car, um, you know, pushed in and no, no food, no water. And all of a sudden, we, the train stops and, you know, it's cold and all of a sudden, were asked to walk, what was it like? Three or four kilometers. To so the you get camp. off the train, yeah. and then was you're that, not right at Bergen Bell, so you have to walk a couple kilometers to yes. get there. Yeah. Was, and the train is jam-packed with people. And how did the, these people die during the train ride, or not then? About 10% of the people died en route on any of the trains, especially uh, to the eastern death camps in Poland, because it was a five-day ride. Bergen Belsen right. was a one-day ride. All right, so you're five or six years old. Yes. You're walking a couple kilometers. You get to Bergen-Belsen, and they didn't separate you from your parents very often. My brother had a lot of trouble walking. Yes. My, <laughs> my mother was trying to hold on to us and the suitcases. They had, they had two small suitcases. I have a particular love for dogs, and the German guards all had, had German shepherds, and I got loose from my mother because she just couldn't handle it, and I started toddling towards the dog, and my father, of course, German, he looked very German, blue-eyed, came after me. And the guard raised his rifle and said, get back in line or I'll shoot. It's good to know German. Small things save your life. And he said to him in German, essentially, you have a big pair. Get your son, get your child, and get back in line. Okay. So, all right. So all right, you get to Bergen-Belsen. Are you separated in Bergen-Belsen from your parents? Or you never, was there a child's part of Bergen-Belsen? Or you could live with your parents in whatever you lived in? No, my father was um, in another part of the camp. So he was separated. And my mother and the two of us were with her. And you know, in the beginning, it was bearable. There was some other children. And I think even my mother ran a little school group or kindergarten or, but you know, that was the early days. Um, and then things rapidly declined because Bergen-Belsen then became the landing spot from all the death marches and, you know, people from other countries. So then it became hideously overcrowded. But um, there was no more horse meat in the soup. So what did you get to eat? What, what kind of food did they give you? Uh, the, the diet was in, in the morning, adults more got uh, some ersatz coffee, fake coffee. My mother used it. We didn't see a toothbrush for a year and a half, uh, or a bath, or toilet paper. And my mother would dip her finger in the coffee and try and clean her teeth. Uh, the main meal was kohlrabi, which is a form of turnips, which came out in large garbage cans around noontime, and you stood in line <coughs> to, with, with, your, and with your cup. So you weren't crying all the time? You're six years old, you're in this ridiculous situation, terrible situation, I would imagine you were crying, and were you not? We never, well, uh, Stephen can add to this, but when my fa father wrote his memoirs, and even when my mother gave her testimony before the Holocaust Museum, the one thing that they said that made them so sad is that very soon we lost all affect. Um, we didn't cry, we didn't laugh, we didn't talk. We just were there. And where were you sleeping? You, your mother had a, a, one of those... Uh... We were very desirable when it came to sleeping arrangements. Because you were Stephen, small. Stephen, why did you write? Well, we were small, so we, we were the ideal bunk. We, we, we slept on wooden planks 
because the ticking that was used was taken, it was full of lice, and it was taken to a small pot-bellied stove and burned, and then eventually the planks so of the bunk. You're, every night were you sleeping next to people who might yes. die? That, yes, that yes, yes, because then people were sleeping yes. free. But, but it's, that was our life. It was nothing special. So when people, you're waking up and somebody's dead next to was, you just... Was dead, and in, in the morning they would drag the bodies outside. There were 10,000 okay. unburied bodies. And how did you avoid the lice? You, cu you, you couldn't, but happily we didn't realize what, how deadly they were. And I still remember Marion and I would be sitting outside. My, my mother told us that, or to, told me that we were gray, that we didn't cry, we didn't complain, we just sat, we did what we were told. Marion and I would pick lice out of our hair because, not, not because we realized they were deadly with typhus, but because they itched. And I still remember the noise they made when you cracked them between your overgrown nails. So, okay, so you're there, and then some people are being sent from Bergen-Belsen to Auschwitz. Is that right? No. No? No. I thought some were. They, they, they died right there. They, they came from Auschwitz to Bergen-Belsen, okay. but, but I can't say with certainty it never happened, but there was not a regular transport from Bergen-Belsen to Auschwitz. So I thought some people were taken from Bergen-Belsen and sent to death places where there were uh, extermination camps, no? Well, th th there's no way that, that anybody would know okay. with certainty, but not as a regular. Th All right. So as the war is moving forward, uh, the R Russians and the Americans are convening on Bergen-Belsen and other concentration camps. At some point, you're put on a train, both of you, with your parents to go where? The so-called lost train. Where, where were well, you going? Well, we didn't know the destination. I mean, the Germans were losing the war and they wanted to hide the evidence. So they thought, let's put these people on a train. We were led to believe that we were taken to a death camp, that they just wanted to get rid of us. Um, but it turned out that, you know, the gas chambers at Auschwitz, they had already been blown up. So, um, so that I think the original destination of our train, there were actually three trains, but only ours was the lost train, uh, was Theresienstadt, but we didn't go to Theresienstadt. So this train just meandered uh, because, you know, the Germans were losing the war, so the tracks were being taken by trains that were going from east to west. Um, and so, you know, we, sometimes we were on a siding for two or three days, and then the train would... How long were you on the so-called lost train? Was that a couple days, weeks? Thirteen days and fourteen nights. Hey, all right, so eventually, um, the, the people driving the trains, I guess, either leave the trains or they abandon them, and the Russians and the Americans come over and say, guess what, the war's over, you're okay, but they put you in a kind of a different situation. Where, where do they put you then? Well, first of all, I mean, the train was in itself a death camp because so many people died on the train. Do you remember them dying? And you just, what did they do, just they throw them no, off the train? No, of course. Well, you know, corpses at, for us were, I don't know, like something on the floor. Um, you know, that was so much a part of our life. I remember when I came to uh, America, um, I, was, I had a friend, an African-American friend, who, and she invited me to her grandmother's funeral. This is shortly after we arrived in America. And I remember that I ran home and I told my mother and I said, I went to a funeral of my friend's grandmother and it was the most unusual thing. She was buried individually in a casket. And you know that was you weren't used to that. They are. It was all right. So eventually, you were you were put in a place. You go to a city where there is um, some food. For the first time ever, you get food of any consequence. What was it like? Did you just uh, gorge yourself on food. Well, yeah. of course, there were no stores. There were. This was a very small town. Right. About seven hundred people. The men were mostly gone. Uh, and what what food you got, you stole. Or you, it was it was foreign country, okay. so my father had a bi found a bicycle, stole a bicycle, uh, and went out every day to find okay. a chicken, to find potatoes. We had our first bath in a year and a half. And, uh, the, Amer and the Americans eventually came and said, "You're free, but you got to go to another camp because we have to put you in some camp." Is well, the, the, what had actually happened was that they were trying to sort out the survivors, so we ran into the Soviets 
we weren't really liberated, we ran into them. The train got to a, uh, the Black Esther River and couldn't go anymore. Okay, when the war is over, yes. and finally the Americans say, okay, you can go back to where you came from, you came from the Netherlands. Did you go back to the Netherlands? Was it hard to get back there? They put us on a train and headed towards the Netherlands. They no, saw. But the, but when we got to Amsterdam, we had we did, weren't welcome. Was your no. own house still no. there, or own apartment there? No, no. No, it was all gone. And so, were there any possessions that your mother had stored that <clears> were still there? A lot, a lot would disappear, and a lot they recovered. Okay. All right. At what point did your parents say? we got to get out of the Netherlands. It's still not so friendly for um, Jewish people. How I, did think you get I, I think um, after we survived and came back to Amsterdam, and that was kind of an unwelcome return uh, because really the Dutch didn't want any German Jews. Um, I think it was my father's dream right away to go to America for but, him. But was that it hard? was a beacon of democracy or freedom and it was an uphill battle, but um, eventually somebody sponsored us, okay. and we were able to. All right. So, where did when did you come here, the United States? When did you actually get here? January first, nineteen forty-seven. Forty-seven. And where did you go? We first lived in the Upper West Side with a relative in the same building as a relative of my father. And did you speak any English then, either no. of you? No English. You spoke only what? Dutch or? Well, I knew I knew three words: chewing gum, uh, and Hershey bar, and and the adults knew Lucky Strike but because you, we we but would you beg spoke them. Dutch, basically, you're Dutch. Uh, only yeah. only Dutch. Dutch, but we understood German. All right. So you come to do you go to a public school here then? For the first time, I mean, we had gone for a short time to a Montessori school, but we had never actually been to school. We didn't know the language, so we're nine years old by that time, and we're put in kindergarten um, in, a, in a school right across Columbia Presbyterian. But were you not malnourished, and were you smaller than you should be for your age because you didn't have food for a long time? Well, smaller, yes, and st I, I still am. Uh, but, by that time, <laughs> but by that time, we had, uh, it was t two years since the war, and so we had gotten plenty of food in the meantime. Okay, so, all right, so you go to public school, and how hard was it to learn the language? You know, Half a year. Yeah, we, I went to summer camp, uh, summer camp for refugees. So we arrived in January, and this was the summer. That's when the polio okay. epidemic, um, around the time. So, of course, everybody you, sent you, the kids to but camp. Did, were you treated differently because you were a Holocaust survivor? Maybe the phrase hadn't <laughs> been used then, but did the other kids say, where do you come from, and aren't you a little different than us? Well, when we first came here, we were like celebrities because we were twins. We had survived the Holocaust, and so we were feted by Eleanor Roosevelt and the United Nations, the mayor of Chinatown, and I remember that, you know, I kind of asked, what is all the fuss about? And my mother explained that we were Holocaust survivors and we were twins who survived the Holocaust. And that's when I told her, I said, I don't only want to be known as a Holocaust survivor, I want to be known as an American girl. Um, right. So, okay. um, you know, so, um, you know, we were treated differently when we very much, I think, wanted to just go on with life. I mean, certainly the Holocaust has always marked us. It marked my family, especially my father, more than it did us. But my father and my parents, and that was one of their wonderful traits, um, felt blessed coming to America. What did they do here? Did they get jobs easily or not? My father became a traveling salesman, you know, quite. Okay. But he was extremely it was always in the concentration camp when he was beaten beyond recognition and he was put into, well, it was not a hospital, but it was kind of a kind of an infirmary and I visited him and, I mean, he was just a skeleton and he wanted to shave. He said, I want to maintain my dignity however I can and he had me hold up a small broken mirror or a tin can, and he shaved. Uh, you know, that was one of his qualities. Right. He always wanted to so, be dignified. He always told us when we came to America, 
um, you know, you have to behave as if the Queen of England well, is going uh, to stop How old in. did your parents live to be? My mom, 89. Dad, uh, okay. And, and so both of you went to college? Yes. And where'd you go? I went. These days, I don't want to say, but it's Columbia. Columbia. <laughs> okay. And you went I went to, to Barnard. My Barnard. parents saved up uh, to, you know, send one of us either out of town or both of us. Right, so you both went and you commuted so from your house. Right. Okay, and you had a career then later in what? In health, health policy, okay. health economics. And you had a career in? I was a naval officer first for four years, but today is called giving back, but, okay. I, but I loved it. And then I spent my career in the photographic industry. And have you ever been back to Bergen-Belsen? Oh, yeah. Yes, we did. We, we had a reunion in 1995. What was it like to go there? It, 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 no recognition, just grass and, wow. and memorials. It was, the smell was okay. missing. There was nothing okay. there. Um, what did they miss describing that is in your book that we should tell people about? Um, I, th I think they did a beautiful job. Um, I think um, they missed telling about how they taunted the guards in the guard station. They would be sta the guards would be stationed uh, above the barbed wire electrified fences. But the children, this would be early on while they still had some energy. Um, later on, they became just um, hard, hard right. to do anything at all. They just sat all day. But early on, they would run around freely in the camp. Wow. They got a group of friends and children, and they would run around, and they would come close to the guard station. They'd come a little closer and a little closer okay. and taunt the guards until the guards would say, halt, or I will shoot. And they would have shot the, the children. But then the children would just laugh and run away. So let me ask you, the scars of having lived through this, um, do they part of your life, the rest of your life? You're always thinking about this every day, or you kind of put it out of your mind and just go forward? Would diametrically we're diametrically different. You're, you're, you're twins. What do you mean? You're, you're because Marion, Marion is very positive. Okay, so you. All right, so you're you have a different view. I do have a different view. You know, there's never a day that I don't think of what happened to us, but I I, I do think of it in terms of how blessed I've been. Uh, to be in America, to have a wonderful life. Um, so I, you know, I, I give thanks that, but you know, you never, I mean, first of all, there's always a sense of guilt because why did I survive right. when so many people just as worthy as me didn't uh, well, make Anne it. Frank was at Bergen-Belsen? Yep, and, and his sister. you didn't know her before the no, I think were. my parents vaguely knew. I mean, the Dutch, you know, the, I mean, the German Jews was, okay. you know, they knew each other, but it wasn't, okay. we weren't best friends. Okay. So um, let me ask, here's a couple of questions we have. Um, one of them is, what is the best way for young Jewish people today to combat anti-Semitism? Any views on that? Uh, uh, well, the this is a venue, this, is, this helps, but it, it's tough because it, it, you really don't change minds. You can quiet people, but you, you don't change minds. But education is, is, the, is the one key that always works. Right. And when you hear that people deny that the Holocaust occurred, so-called Holocaust denial, denialism, denialism <laughs> uh, what do you say and how do you combat that in your view? Uh, well, well, I tell them that all the documentation and all the proof of the Holocaust was, came from the Germans, not from the Jews. Yes, the Ringelbaum letters were found in milk cans in Warsaw, but, but all the history, the, the Einsatzgruppen shootings, right. were all reported to Germany and survived. So when you were, uh, your children were young, did you talk to them about this, or you generally just didn't want to talk about it? I didn't. Um, I never wanted them to burden, burden them. And actually, it's only in the last maybe 10, 15 years that I talk about it. And you know, actually, when this book came out, people, many people were very, very surprised. Okay. Um, 
And did you ever talk to your children about this? I, I was, uh, I've taught the Holocaust for 40 years, so my kids couldn't avoid it. Okay. Uh, you know, they heard me All speak. Right. So let's uh, conclude with one final question. What would you like people to take away from reading this book? What was the message that you would like people to take away from reading this book? And I'd like you to conclude, if you would, what, what was the main message you would like readers to take away with? But why don't we start with Marianne? Um, you know, first of all, sadly, we haven't learned the message of the Holocaust. Or generally, in humanity, um, to, you know, what people do, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Gaza. Um, you know, I always feel there's got to be a better way to resolve disputes um, than just murdering each other and killing each other. Um, so we really haven't learned the lesson of the Holocaust. And one of the things that appealed to us when the publisher asked whether they could kind of write this book, have someone write this book, is that this publisher specializes in big box stores like Walmart and um, and I said, you know, that's middle America. Those people could learn this lesson. So, um, you know, we, we still have a way to go. And the other part is that even in the worst of times, even when life is a nightmare 24 hours a day, there are people like our parents who have the resilience um, and the will and the spirit um, to overcome, and that's a real inspiration. Okay, what would you like people to t well, take away? May I ask you? Yeah, go ahead. The most interesting story has not been told. Please tell why you ended up in Bergen Belsen and the Paraguayan passport, and then Marion will relate about your last conversation. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, you know, we learned, I only learned about six years ago when someone called me from the Polish embassy out of the blue um, and, and asked, you know, please don't hang up on me. And he said, I have something to tell you. And he knew, you know, it was your name, Marion Hess. Do you have a twin brother? Were your parents calling Ilsa? And they informed me for the first time that we actually had Paraguayan passports at one point. And with those Latin American passports, um, that was the reason why we were sent to Bergen-Belsen, the very likely reason of Auschwitz, because the, you know, the, I think Americans or some people convinced the Nazis, you know, there's some people that are worth more alive than dead because you can use them as exchange right. prisoners. Okay. So, so, all right, so the main message that you would like somebody to take away from reading this book is what? You're the author? Yes, main message. Uh, well, people do ask me why would I write not just one, but two books about those dark times? Why would I stay in those dark times? Um, so I think most centrally, I think these stories need to be told. The people set upon by the Nazis and their collaborators um, need to be remembered and not lost in some sort of vague historic haze. The Holocaust must never be forgotten or allowed to become a vague term, which is actually happening right now, as, as um, Stu was, was explaining to us, uh, with the meaning sort of drained out of it. Um, the term Nazi is, is sometimes now bandied about as a sort of a joke sometimes. Um, the, the towel Nazi, the soap Nazi, um, as humor. But I'd like people to, to remember, um, and I think the, the, the most important dimension, I think, of the Holocaust is that in dark times um, is when human nature um, reveals itself so very clearly um, with all of our potential for evil and for good. And in times that might have seemed hopeless, the Hess family was courageous. They risked death to help each other and fellow prisoners. And they found strength where others might expect despair. 
And I think those dark times um, raise questions for our own lives. What would I have done if I had been in that situation in the Netherlands and um, as a Jew or as a non-Jew? Would, would I have hidden Jewish children and families as a, some Dutch people did and others did not? Um, okay, so... So I think it's a question of, of um, finding hope where others might give up and, and find despair. Your main despair. message should be people should read the book and buy 100 copies for their friends. Is that it? <laughs> That's what your publisher would say that is the main message. That would be all right message. with me. Okay. So, look, um, this is a, obviously a complicated subject that we all know too much about, unfortunately, in terms of having read about it, lived through it many times over the years. Uh, but you can't really read too much about the Holocaust because there is Holocaust denialism going out there as Stuart uh, articulated uh, right now. Many young people don't believe in it. And, uh, you know, when, when, when Eisenhower saw what was going on at some of the concentration camps, he brought members of Congress over and he brought the reporters over because he wanted to make sure that people photographed this because he was afraid that people would deny it happened because it was so hard to believe. Mm -hmm. And he had, obviously had a lot of foresight. So we have pictures, we have evidence, but there's still a large percentage of people, unfortunately, who still believe it actually didn't happen. So I want to thank you both for cooperating with the author. Thank you for writing the book, and thank you all for coming.